Hello, and welcome to AdAge's custom webcast sponsored by Redpoint Global. The topic of today's webcast is how to use customer data to drive engagement. I'm Christopher Hosford with the AdAge team, and I'm your moderator today. Now let's get started. I'd like to introduce our presenter for today. Steve Zisk is Senior Product Marketing Manager at Redpoint Global. Steve is a seasoned technology professional with more than 35 years of expertise in software engineering and product marketing, and is tasked with developing messaging and marketplace positioning for Redpoint's customer engagement platforms. Steve joined Redpoint from Pegasystems, where he was a senior product marketing manager for the company's business process management and CRM platforms. Steve also previously worked as an OEM support engineer for Adobe and held a solutions architect role with JDA and Gage before transitioning into product marketing. Now, just a note on the format of today's webcast. I will be asking the audience a series of poll questions throughout Steve's presentation today. And we invite you to participate and compare your answers to those of your peers on this webcast. Now, as a reminder, it's completely anonymous, but the, result, the live results of each poll will be shared directly after each question is asked. So we look forward to everybody participating and being part of this conversation. Steve, uh, it's all yours, so take it away. Thank you so much, Chris. I'd like to start us off by posing a little bit of a problem slash conundrum challenge for marketers and others, which is customer experience. Customer experience is the capstone, the core value that customer-oriented and, and uh, customer-centric companies have today. But how did it get to be this way? Over the past several years, customer experience has come to the fore in a way that it perhaps was not 10 years ago. And we'd like to explore a little bit why this has happened as a precursor to actually talking about how customer data can be used to improve and enhance customer experience. First thing to understand is that customer experience is really an interaction between consumers or customers, and that can also include groups like healthcare patients, um, uh, consumers consuming financial services, and so on, not just retail customers. But it, it's a conversation between consumers and the brands that they find important, and consumers have been increasing their expectations of brands over the past years to the point where 73% of consumers recognize that brands are not meeting consumer expectations for personalized omnichannel CX. So this means that we as marketers have to create and market to mass audiences of one. We have to reach every customer with an appropriate action an appropriate offer, an appropriate piece of information in order to meet that customer demand for personalized omnichannel CX. If we don't do that, we should recognize that customers will potentially leave our brands or do less business with our brands than they otherwise would have because the experience is poor. We can see this in all kinds of different ways. Brands that create a good customer experience, boost their interactions, boost their sales, boost their value to customers, net promoter scores, however you want to measure it. The value to the customers is high for brands that meet the uh, customers' needs for personalization. This shows up in all kinds of different ways, in all kinds of polls. What I'm showing you here is a recent poll question from the CDP Institute uh, done in September of 2020, brand new question, um, which best describes the current state of customer-facing systems at your company? And as you can see down in the deep blue colors there, um, these companies have many systems connected to a unified customer database and either um, with or without a shared orchestration engine to be able to orchestrate customer experiences across their, uh, both, both for brands who are trying to reach customers as retailers are and for brands that don't necessarily have a direct 
uh, connection with their customers. Brands need to reach customers and uh, uh, make customer experience best across a multitude of touch points, and this becomes harder for a variety of reasons. The first of those reasons is that the number of different channels and devices that customers are using in order to uh, interact with brands has gone up. We're no longer just using a computer. We're using computers, cell phones, uh, tablets, kiosks, uh, branch locations, all kinds of different places, and we're using multiple different apps in this context. We may be using social apps as well as e-commerce apps that directly interface with the customer or indirectly through groups like Amazon. The second change that I want to identify here is the fragmentation of MarTech teams. When the primary means of reaching your customer was through direct mail or email, the fact that you might have two different teams doing that didn't matter so much. But as all of the different touch points have gotten added on over the past many years, we've discovered that having a different team for each touch point, a different piece of technology controlling each touch point actually interferes with customer experience because the information that a customer is sharing on one of those touch points may or may not arrive on other touch points. Third, the complexity of a customer journey has increased tremendously with the advent of independent sites for understanding product buying, product recommendation sites. Uh, customers are bringing their phones into stores and actually looking at reviews while they're looking at the physical um, object in front of them. Now with COVID, the requirement that we be using things, tools like AR and VR, uh, augmented reality and virtual reality to examine products that we may not be able to see in person. So the complexity of the customer journey has exploded along with data and channel proliferation and fragmentation into multiple different teams. Then there's also the rapid pace of change, the number of different devices that people use, the number of different touch points that they use, the applications that they use across different touch points, how many customers are using TikTok today, whereas five years ago, TikTok wasn't even a thing. There were different applications, different ideals for how to interface with um, uh, uh, brands and uh, different ways for brands to pick up information and to share their uh, aspirations and expectations with customers. And then finally, all of this is happening in a changing regulatory and um, consumer context with regards to privacy and compliance. The number of different breaches that we've seen over the past 20 years, the number of regulations like GDPR, CCPA, the Nevada regulations and others that are intended to protect consumer privacy, and the rising expectations of customers for how those expectations are going to be met is very high. This also extends even beyond classical retailing into arenas like healthcare, where because of the current advent of telehealth, there's a whole new set of applications, a whole new set of data points, a whole new set of privacy and compliance concerns that are only partially addressed by um, uh, regulations like HIPAA. So, in the context of all of these changes to the sources of customer data, how is customer data actually going to be um, translated into value inside a brand, and what are the obstacles that we're going to see for um, being able to, to use that customer data in order to improve customer experience? From the same poll that I talked about earlier, the CDP Institute poll in September, we'll take one more statistic. And I promise this is the last poll that we're going to do out there. All the rest of the polling questions that we do throughout this will be you get a chance to answer the questions that we ask and see what your colleagues are doing uh, in the same context. What are your main obstacles to better customer data utilization? You can't assemble unified customer data. You don't have the staff or skill. 
you can't apply the customer data to the delivery systems, the touch points and, and campaigns and so on. You can't cooperate with all of the other teams across your organization. And we will touch on a number of these in our poll questions and in discussing other aspects of getting control of your customer data. So right now, I'd like to start with the first poll question just to get us started and give you a chance to have an easy time understanding what's happening with your customer data. So our first poll question is, do you collect data on customers and prospects across your marketing touch point? The point here is that if you're not getting the data that you need from all of the different touch points, it's going to become very difficult for you to actually understand what your customers are ask, asking for and respond to your customers with relevant, appropriate, real-time offers. We've now got about 70 different answers in, and it's probably a good time to um, share the results of this question. Um, I will also put an immediate subsequent polling question out. Um, the next polling question is going to be, uh, and, and I will also uh, respond to this. You can put up the next polling question. Um, I would note that among our users, 68 of our listeners, which is um, about 75% of our users, recognize that they're collecting basic data from important touch points, but they're not able to get all of the data collected across all of the marketing touch points that they need. This is not a surprise. Most people are at least partway along in their journey, but are looking for solutions that will help them get much further along to collecting marketing data. Uh, and this ties nicely into uh, our next poll question, which is data unification. Do you bring the customer data that you've collected together into a unified customer data store? This becomes important for your marketing teams because if you have a fragmented view of your customer across all of those different touch points, even if you've collected the data, you may not be able to compute or understand or analyze or respond to the data from one touch point in meeting a customer across other touch points. So data unification is a core value that you will find in a customer data platform, one of the many ways that you have of bringing data together, but one of them that's pretty popular and uh, has experienced quite a bit of hype over the past um, few years. And if we look at our answers now to the question, do you bring customer data together into a unified customer data store, we'll see here that the vast majority of our customer, of our listeners, almost 65%, uh, say that some data is brought together for analytics or campaigns. But you'll notice that a pretty strong second answer here is that teams and channels handle their own data. There's no unified store yet. So the need for a unified store may have been identified, but there can be a number of different things that can get in the way of putting together a unified store. And among those is the value that you might get out of such a unified store. Um, we'll talk about some of the things um, that can get in your way in terms of understanding unified stores and data ingestion in general in an other considerations slide here. The first thing to note is that to build a 360-degree view of your customers, you may need to include data from other enterprise areas, not just from your um, Mar MarTech touch points or ad tech, but also from systems like point-of-sale systems, customer relationship management systems, or other kinds of customer support stores, uh, product registration systems. There's a pretty broad range of touch points that you may not have thought of that actually contain significant customer data. You may also want to include relevant third-party information like demographics, firmographics if you're, if you're doing B2B or trying to uh, get an understanding of organizational relationships, social data, geospatial, and so on as needed in order to get a complete picture of the customer. For customer sentiment, interaction history and intent, extract and analyze data from unstructured sources. This is a, an, an important one. If the only thing that you're doing is 
touching data that's well organized and well understood, you may be missing things like social posts, call center logs, or patient notes in, in uh, um, healthcare systems. Understanding what the information is that might be locked up inside those unstructured sources is very important. And then finally, part of future proofing your customer interactions is to make sure that you can quickly add new data sources, whether that's more tech touch points, new devices, smart devices, or something that we can't even anticipate right now uh, as they become relevant for your use cases. The next area I'd like to have you think about is understanding um, what you're going to do. You've, you've now talked a little bit about bringing all of the data together, but what else do I have to do in order to connect all of the dots and create a fantastic golden record that represents everything we want to know about the customer? And there's a number of tasks here, things like data quality and data hygiene, um, as well as integration across both internal and external systems, data prep for analytics, uh, understanding how to handle big data if that's in play at your customer, and understanding the requirements for streaming and IoT and other kinds of real-time data. So we'll talk about some of these tasks a little bit next. And we're going to do that, again, through a set of poll questions. The next poll question, question number three, is on data hygiene. Do you cleanse and manage your customer data for accuracy, completeness, and quality. It's pretty simple to understand um, some basic pieces of this, things like phone numbers. What does an area code look like? What's the format that you get a phone number in uh, in Europe or in the rest of the world versus our slightly provincial view of things in the United States where we stick the area code inside parentheses instead of putting a, a plus in front of it? Um, and there are much more complicated versions of the same kinds of questions regarding names. How do you understand the distinction between Steve and Steven? If you have two people, Steve Zisk and Steven Zisk, is it really the same person or not? So in order to be able to answer questions like that, you have to be able to cleanse and manage your customer data for completeness, accuracy, and policy. And if we look at the survey answers that we've got on this, um, most of our listeners are doing at least some basic cleansing. And the actual number two answer here, I'm very happy to see, is complete cleansing, normalization, and data quality. Data quality is often thought of as an IT function, but this at least recognizes that data quality is a, is a necessary precursor to being able to handle customer data in a way that becomes uh, relevant and personal for your individual customers. If we take a look at our next poll question, um, which is closely related to this, is can you normalize and cleanse offline data like addresses, company names, phone numbers, and so on? Uh, again, the importance of this is that not everybody's life is lived entirely online. If you've got product registration information, if you've got shipping information, um, if you've got billing address information, all of those contain pieces of offline data that you may need to be able to correlate appropriately with other sources of data in order to understand who the customer is. And there's a lot of different things that go on with that kind of offline data that can get in the way if you don't have a, a capability to really handle and understand um, the, the details of how to normalize addresses, company names, phone numbers, uh, product information, uh, relating divisions to company names, even simple things like uh, a recognition that Avenue of the Americas is really the same street as Sixth Avenue. If we look at our survey answers now, we can see that people collect offline data but don't do very much um, data cleansing on it. Um, a significant minority of people actually do do some cleansing and of their offline data, which is really good. Congratulations to you guys. The rest of us slackers need to be able to do a little better job of this in the future. Um, this will make a, a big difference for integrating some of those um, 
uh, unstructured records from places like call centers because this will allow you to better match and understand the, the uh, relationships and identification between information that you have online and offline. And that's going to be um, the subject of, of uh, our next poll, which will happen in a few slides here. Um, before we get there, I want to point out that um, once you've pulled all of that data together, you need to perform a set of tasks in order to marry it together appropriately. And this includes identity resolution. Um, most CDPs and uh, many other pieces of software do some elementary identity resolution. Um, a lot of ad tech does interesting probabilistic identity resolution on anonymous information using identity graphs. There's a whole bunch of interesting techniques to understand here. Um, the, the main thing to recognize is that identity resolution is not simply stitching together information based on known identifiers. You've got to get beyond the idea that I can simply use an IP address or a phone number as the identifier for my customer. In addition to identity resolution, you have to be able to build out that single customer view and make it available uh, at the appropriate cadence for the, the use of your um, marketing touch points, marketing teams, and even beyond marketing. And you want to do this using advanced matching um, uh, and potentially adding in things like master data management and data governance as well as um, uh, privacy and compliance uh, against those customer golden records. If you can do all of those things, then you're not only well on the way to, to building a golden record, but you're also well on your way to being able to take advantage of that golden record for the actual business purposes that you're after. Nobody wants a golden record for itself. And we'll get into those purposes in a little while. But meanwhile, I'd like to go to another poll question. Poll question five, identity resolution. Do you do identity matching with merging and deduplication across data sources to build more accurate and complete records? Chris, does this one, um, does this one resonate with things that you've heard out in the industry? Yeah, it certainly does. Um, you're, um, I'm assuming you're uh, assume uh, you're referring to uh, the Steve Zisk versus Steven Zisk or the Stephen Q Zisk, uh, that type of thing, um, at merging and deduping, uh, certainly identifying who's unique, uh, and then getting rid of uh, the two or more um, references that are the same person. I see that a lot. That, yes that you're exactly right about that, and also recognizing that uh, even a name as relatively uncommon as mine, I'm not the only Steven Zisk in the world. So simply being able to say I have two records that both say Steven Zisk doesn't necessarily mean I've got the same person. You've got to look at all of the signals, all of the behaviors to understand what's really going on. If we look at the answers to our questions here, um, we can see that for identity matching, most of our audience, about half, does simple matching or stitching across touch points using known identifiers. That's the thing that I said is a good first step, but is not enough. And the rest of our audience is about evenly divided between doing no identity matching at all, uh, which is probably the people who leave the channel data in the channels, so that's not too much of a surprise, and doing some more robust identity matching across data sources using both the identifiers and other customer attributes for, for this. So understand that identity matching is a very important problem to solve, but it's not the only problem that we want to talk about. So we'll look at the next poll question. Advanced matching. Can you use probabilistic and, and deterministic matching to meet your specific use cases? Um, the point of this, Chris, is that uh, different kinds of matching may be appropriate for different kinds of use cases. For instance, if, if I'm trying to determine billing information, I may have to have an absolutely perfect match to understand what I'm doing with billing my customer. 
same thing for if I'm trying to uh, contact the customer with some private personal information for HIPAA, I better make sure that I know I'm, I'm contacting the customer that, that um, I care about. That's why they give you the bracelets inside the, the um, hospital and have you read off your date of birth every time they're talking to you. Um, whereas for a simple marketing use case, you may be able to get, get away with much looser matching and you may have some value in trying to merge some information that otherwise would be left aside about a customer. So if we look at the answers to these questions, we can see that um, many people are using whatever the CRM vendor provides, and a few people are doing little or no advanced identity matching. Um, and again, this is not a surprise. For many people, the CRM uh, is, in their minds, the, the master for their customer data, and uh, they may want to extend beyond the CRM in order to to understand other sources of customer data, but the CRM is not necessarily the be-all and the end-all when it comes to understanding customer data and being able to move beyond that into um, doing your own matching inside a CEP or inside other software um, uh, provides some important value. I'd like to talk a little bit about some other considerations for matching for hygiene and identity. Um, as you bring data together from many different sources, uh, it's really important to manage, append, and aggregate all the merged elements, uh, and as well as to track and calculate uh, things that, that might be relevant to understanding the customer journey, things like details of transactions, uh, particular behaviors on the website, um, uh, KPIs that are, that are relevant to uh, response or customer value and other kinds of dynamic details. Uh, many digital use cases require real-time or near real-time customer data, uh, and the reason for that is you want to avoid making in-the-moment decisions based on out-of-date information. So being able to bring together all of that data, uh, forge the golden record, do accurate identity matching and hygiene, and then uh, handle the aggregation and calculation that's needed all in real time becomes uh, uh, a strong capability to drive uh, real-time interactions with your customer based on relevant, timely, accurate information. The next step in the process of uh, perfecting CX for your customer is to decide what you're going to do once you have that golden record. What kind of interactions do you want with your customer? Those may be based on things like um, uh, providing outstanding analytics information in real time to your analytics team, performing machine learning to create models that are either predictive or prescriptive against the customer data that you have, making decisions based on those models or based on human curated information in real time, um, understanding how your campaign or how the customer journey is operating by looking at changes in data, trending and, and tuning in real time, and then using all of that information to drive optimization efforts, whether those are based on um, things like A-B testing or other kinds of optimization mechanisms across multiple different um, uh, sets of data and touch points. If we look at the kinds of questions that are relevant to data analytics in the context of the customer data that we've been gathering, our next poll question um, raises some insights here. Do you provide complete customer records for your analytics and decisioning uses? Chris, do you want to make a comment on this one? Well, you know, complete customer records is, is very interesting. I, I'm assuming that, that that's all of the data that you have from website visits, from social media interactions, uh, and you mentioned even off-site data that you might have uh, from in-store or um, uh, other in-person uh, type of interactions. So uh, complete customer records uh, into a unified uh, data set is extremely important, I would think, and perhaps even rare. 
You're absolutely right about that. And uh, particularly for analytics, whether it's machine learning or other things, the, the other interesting element about complete records is to make sure that you're not just boiling down or condensing or throwing away older data or missing some of the signals because there's a lot of different nitpicky little bits of information. Which page did I hover on? How long did I stay there? What page did I go to next? Um, how much time was there between when I put something in a shopping cart and when I actually purchased it? Those kinds of signals can allow you to identify in detail customer behaviors that might affect customer experience, both in the current experience and for the next experience. If we look at the answers to this question, we see that um, the majority of our users, a slight majority, extracted data to share with analytics and channel teams. It's about 50% of our customers. Uh, the next largest set of customers uh, are doing analytics and decisioning within each team or channel, which is a good start, but recognizing that analytics and customer experience is, is a group and team sport, and you want to have your whole organization focused on it, well, is a very important step towards customer data maturity. Trying to do all of that individual work out in the, the individual teams and with separate teams and channels means that you are potentially duplicating effort, um, not getting access to all of the data that you need, or otherwise uh, leaving some parts of customer experience on the table instead of being able to improve the customer experience. Our next Poll question follows up on the analytics uh, in general by asking, can you use customer data for relevant, up-to-date machine learning models? And the point of this question is that if you're going to build out a, a golden record, an accurate, up-to-date, and complete customer record, one of the core uses for that, one of the values that we've seen rise from relatively low importance to quite high importance over the past three to five years is developing machine learning models that allow us to understand our customers better. Some of these models are pretty obvious, things like, oh, is this customer likely to churn? Other models may be a little more subtle, like um, what's the best possible message that I might put in front of this group of customers? And yet other questions that you might want to ask are um, quite a bit more subtle, but may be relevant to uh, helping the marketer automate an, an ever larger portion of their job. Things like um, what uh, offer, ha uh, uh, what image is the best image to go with this in front of this set of customers based on past experience and based on uh, a calculated customer affinity for particular kinds of images. So machine learning has, is slowly graduating from simply being um, uh, uh, a uh, toy for the data scientists to play with to being a core tool that everybody who is concerned with CX needs to understand. And if we look at our survey, we can see that uh, as, as we might expect, people are in a pretty broad different set of states on this, namely about half of the users that, that uh, answered this poll question for us today say they don't know this, is, this belongs to a separate function, this is, belongs to a separate team. Um, in some way, it's not part of their customer experience remit. Of the remainder, um, in order of maturity, some customer data is extracted or, or um, queried by data scientists on my behalf. Uh, for about 20% of customers, up to only 7% of our customers already have an easy-to-use or automated capability to build models with customer data and deploy them in, in order to meet their use cases. So there's a lot of room. The point of this is um, if you're starting down this journey, the, the fact that you haven't gotten very far should not discourage you. There's a lot of room for improvement across all of the listeners and across all different 
industries and, and all different kinds of businesses for improving your machine learning models. Other considerations to care about in analytics and machine learning. Analytics itself is a journey, just as I've been saying, requiring both current and historical views of audiences and requiring that you understand um, the distinction between rules and models and how you're putting them out in front of customers, uh, how you can measure results of decisions that are made by human curated rules or machine learning models, um, and how you can um, get some insight into responses by your customers in the midst of their customer journeys to the kinds of uh, offers and actions that are being driven by your analytics and machine learning programs. You're going to want an accurate picture of customer interactions based on experimenting and uh, collecting accurate data, and you're going to want to be able to optimize and optimize, uh, optimize and update your rules and models with things like uh, A-B testing and experiments. And finally, again, um, Governance and compliance requirements have an impact on this in terms of what data you can collect, how you can share that data, what data you might be able to purchase from a third party, uh, and in terms of what uses you're allowed to make of customer data after you've acquired it. So making sure that, that your analytics team is working in close coordination with groups like your IT governance and legal teams becomes important for uh, analytics and machine learning efforts. And there's a whole separate topic of um, uh, ethical AI and uh, ethical analytics that we could cover in another in another uh, uh, session if we wanted to. Boy, that's so, that's so, so important for that whole unified approach to data, isn't it? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Um, you know, we, before we go on, people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But before we go on, I'd go just like to jump in and encourage our audience to send in uh, their questions whenever they can. Uh, we've already got several good ones. Uh, but uh, just as a reminder, you can, you can comment on any of the points Steve made today, uh, any of the polls for that matter, and the slide material as well. Uh, just uh, type your question into the Ask a Question text area and then click the Send button. So keep, keep those good questions coming on and we'll address them at the end. Absolutely. All yours thanks. Now, thanks. Yep. That that's great, Chris. That's that's uh, exactly what we, we want to hear. We like this to be uh, an interactive uh, uh, experience, not just in terms of me asking the questions and you guys answering them, but in terms of exactly as Chris is saying, in terms of you asking questions that are relevant to your experience of customer data management in pursuit of outstanding customer experience. So if we look at our next poll question on data activation, do you use customer data to power campaigns, offers, and interactions? I think this is where the rubber really meets the road. This is where we start to see actual CX out of the use of customer data. Do you want to add to that, Chris? You know, uh, customer experience, the whole, the, the whole point of this discussion today has been on customer experience, and I, I find that just fascinating. Um, uh, to power campaign offers and interactions, obviously campaigns not only are broad brush, but they can also be extremely personal and targeted, uh, not to mention the offers. And when those interactions come in, um, they, they have to be responded to by the marketing team in an extremely personal and targeted way in order for CX to be really effective. Um, is that kind of what your, uh, your approach is here? Yes. Yeah. That's, that's absolutely right. The example, you're, you're making the distinction between an offer and an interaction is really good and interesting because not every interaction with a customer contains an offer. Imagine that I've just bought a pair of hiking boots. You might be tempted to offer me uh, a set of socks to go with the hiking boots or a backpack or something like that. But maybe you know something about me from other customer data that I'm really aspirational and that I'm thinking about climbing um, the Appalachian Trail on a through trail, let's say. And so the next interaction that you send to me is instead a picture of 
sunrise from the top of a mountain to tell me that you understand who I am and what I'm about, and you're not just trying to sell me the next best thing. So let's look at the results of this poll. Um, the, the, do, you, do you use customer data to power campaigns, offers, and interactions? Yes. We use customer data to power our basic campaigns and primary channels for the most part. And the secondary answer is we use customer data and rules across all interactions and touch points. Those are really the kind of the answers I was hoping for because it means that the audience that we have right now is the audience that's actually thinking about this problem this way. You're not just doing data collection and passing it on to other teams. You're actually uh, understanding how that data gets activated um, and uh, making sure that it gets used for the primary channels that you care about. Again, though, there's lots of room for uh, improving what you're doing with activation and with orchestration because using customer data and rules across all of the interactions that you have with customers is going to give you much higher value and it's going to give the customers that relevancy, that consistency that helps them know that you understand who they are and what they're after. Let's look at our next and final question. We'll have a little more time after this to discuss um, some more details of uh, how uh, customer experience operates, but first, do you orchestrate customer data and interactions across multi-channel, multi-touch journeys? In other words, it's not enough to simply say, I'm going to see a customer arriving at my website and I'm going to meet them with an offer. You have to know that they're arriving at my website um, after having used my mobile app to peruse some product pages, so now maybe I understand something about their intent. Or um, I have a customer who's um, on the phone at a call center 15 minutes after they hopped off the website, abandoning a cart in the process. So maybe there's a problem with their purchase, or they're going to ask me a question about one of the products that's in their cart. If you can know those kinds of things, and recognize that the customer is on a journey that goes beyond both the before and after the current touch point, you're a lot more likely to succeed in meeting the customer's experiences, uh, experience expectations, and in delighting the customer. So if we look at the answer to this question, about half of our customers extract data to send to channels for simple campaigns. Uh, among the other half, most of them are either orchestrating data across channels but with some manual work or orchestrating data across interactions and uh, channels automatically. And this is really good. Uh, that, that, that means that uh, people are not mired in the I don't know how to orchestrate customer data. Uh, they have a lot of room for improvement from simply um, uh, extracting data to send into the channel, uh, and the reason for that is if you think about what's happening when you're extracting data and sending it into the channel, as soon as the data goes into that channel, um, it has the potential to be stale. So if I'm sending information to an email service provider that's a list of my customers and the offers that I'm going to put in front of those customers, that's great, but that is only valid at the time that I sent that list to the email service provider. If some of those customers do something subsequently and that would change how I might interact with them in the email channel, I've lost the opportunity to have a relevant interaction. I want instead to be able to do things like when they open the email, um, respond with something that shows that I know who they are right then and be able to give them a dynamic offer. And the same thing is true for every channel, inbound and outbound. I want to be able to meet customers with an offer that's based on the latest possible information and the latest set of rules that I have that might encompass both who that customer is and situations. They've just arrived at a store or a snowstorm is forecast and I need to be able to um, offer to sell them a snow shovel or 
um, uh, I see that that uh, they, together with three other family members, are on vacation in um, Canada, and I need to be able to meet with meet them with something that's relevant to where they are and what they're doing right now. So if we go back to our slides for just a second and think a little more about other considerations that, that might be important to customers. Marketing and other customer-facing technology really needs to be able to respond to real-time changes, customer events, external situations, whether that's weather or location or other kinds of triggers. Even product availability and product information can, can go into the mix. And that all has to happen at the cadence required by whatever your use cases are. Customer privacy requires significant IT interactions to handle things like a security perimeter around your customer data, authorization access to make sure that the people who are looking at customer data have the right to do so, governance to understand privacy requirements and to comply with customer and subject data requests. Um, and finally, recognize customer data is an enterprise asset. asset. It's useful in every aspect of your customer experience, and it's useful in every aspect of your um, marketing measurement and the way that you want to operate with your customers. If we draw ourselves that complete picture, the five points that I talked about earlier, connect the dots, bring in all of the customer data, forge the golden record, predict the next best action, orchestrate across all of the touch points that you care about, and do all of that because you need to be able to deliver the compelling marketing moment. And don't stop there. Keep going. Recognize that you have to measure and report what's going on across all of those points, and you have to be able to learn and optimize everything that's happening from all of those different interactions that your customers are having. Thank you so much for staying with us through this story. I want you to understand that the, this is the only slide that I'm going to give you that's, if you will, a selling slide. We, of course, at Redpoint provide a, a, a customer engagement platform called RG1 that satisfies the needs that we talked about and can help you move along your customer journey to provide outstanding customer experience. With that, I want to go to our questions and answers, uh, and I'll allow Chris to uh, ask me the questions, and we'll, we'll see what we can do to uh, help our marketers with their customer journeys. Sounds good, Steve. Uh, thanks so much for that great presentation. You know, one of the things I was struck with about the polls was that it seemed to go from uh, level A to uh, level Z, if you will. It really is a progression of uh, greater and greater uh, customer experience processes. One of our attendees asks about that and says, hey, are these poll questions part of a maturity assessment to help me learn uh, have more information about myself and my own progress down this pathway? <laughs> what was your thoughts in creating these poll questions, Steve? Well, that's exactly right. That's, that's going down the right course, which is that um, being able to, to both understand our capabilities and understand where there are gaps in our capabilities is a really important way to assess where should my marketing budget go, uh, what should I change about my people and processes to help fill in that, those gaps, how do I measure my success, how do I communicate the importance of what it is that I'm doing to other groups within my company. And a, a customer data management maturity assessment is a great way to do that, and we can certainly uh, help with providing both the questions and with providing some commentary and, and interpretation uh, along with uh, the appropriate ways to uh, address your needs for better customer data. Got it. You know, uh, our next question uh, is, is I think, a, a very basic one, but I think it's an intriguing one in this day of uh, artificial intelligence, uh, uh, smart learning, uh, and certainly mar marketing automation. Um, one of our attendees 
asks about CRM software. Given your background as a CRM uh, expert, um, our attendee asks, is this a good place to start to help me unify the data across my MarTech touch points? Is it adequate? Is it a good place to start? Is it an end in, all, end in its own right? Um, this is going to be different depending on your use cases. If you were a CRM person and you're only caring to measure what you're doing in the CRM world, sure, it's a great place to start. Even in the context of CRM software, though, there's a lot that can be done to improve the data that you might have in your CRM. A lot of what we talked about around identity matching and data hygiene, around uh, calculating things like customer intent and so on, rely on information that may or may not be being collected in your CRM. And certainly, trying to marry information that you may have in things like um, your uh, web interaction logs, your point of sale, your uh, uh, email service provider response rates, and so on, uh, carry a lot of data that's outside the CRM. So I would encourage uh, people who are using a CRM as a starting point to say, that's great, but recognize it's not an end point. It is only one source of data, and uh, understanding how to, how to um, gather the data from all of your MarTech touch points, marry it with the data that you may already have in your CRM system, and create that uh, golden record that we were talking about of data across all of your channels, all of your enterprise systems, all of your third-party data becomes really important. Yeah, absolutely. I, I would agree that unifying a process is essential. You know, one of our attendees asks specifically uh, about an early slide of yours, and I'm going to take the liberty of popping that up right now, slide number 11. And um, our attendees, our attendee uh, asks a simple question, well, makes a simple observation, that batch data seems to be the low-hanging fruit in customer data. Uh, but you mentioned in slide 11, which I've just popped up here, uh, that um, there's plenty of streaming data from all sorts of sources. And let me see if I pop that up again. Where did that go? There we go. All these, all these sources, customer journey, rapid pace of change, privacy compliance, on and on. Uh, referencing these, um, these data, uh, how do you manage all of this into one cohesive story and is artificial intelligence a way to address the common themes that you see? So um, the, the, this is a great question. When you're talking about um, streaming data and getting that into um, the same data store as your batch data, um, there's a bunch of different techniques that you can use. First of all, some sources of streaming data provide what I would call natural identifiers. So um, uh, if if you have information, for instance, from um, uh, something like an IoT uh, intelligent brewer, uh, you may be able to have a serial number on that intelligent brewer that lets you match that up with product registration records and and therefore understand who the customer is for that brewer and and what th what the details are that that brewer is providing about customer experience. Uh, other sources of information may not have that kind of a natural identifier, but um, may be able to be associated and correlated in time or um, uh, based on other signals that are coming in. Um, so the short answer is you, you have to use different techniques depending on the sources and types of streaming data and what the, what the uh, mechanisms are that the data itself provides for you. And absolutely, artificial intelligence or a, a mechanism is one of the tools that you can use both to do things like um, filter the wheat from the chaff, what signals from those streaming devices are important and which ones are not, uh, as well as to be able to identify which customer golden record uh, owns those signals and which one do they belong to. Steve, um, one last question I'd like to ask you. Um, where do you see the future of customer experience going? You'd mentioned uh, about kiosks. Uh, obviously, uh, 
um, a smart television, um, um, personalized ads, uh, uh, interactive uh, this and that. Um, where are we today, and where do you think we will be going uh, in the next year or so, the, the trends that you see on the horizon? So the, the biggest number one trend, I, and this one I think is playing out throughout the developed world, is what I would call um, uh, cross-channel journeys. And uh, we've been doing cross-channel journeys for a while, but they've suddenly become incredibly important because of the advent of COVID. So our buying habits, our shopping habits have changed drastically. Um, malls are out, but um, big box curbside delivery is in. Um, uh, sitting in a restaurant is out, but Grubhub or other kinds of delivery services are in. So the, the, the trend towards being able to have a, a mix of uh, digital interactions with physical online uh, connections uh, is becoming very important. That's, that's item number one for what's happening now. Item number two is sort of a, a corollary of that, which is that some channels that we hadn't really thought of as being particularly important, like um, augmented reality or virtual reality channel views of products, have suddenly taken off. And it's because of things like, uh, I want to be able to see what the interior of that car looks like without actually having to go to a car dealer in order to do so. Or um, I want to be able to see the panoramic view of um, what I'm going to be able to see when I go on vacation because I'm not going on vacation today, but I might be planning uh, a blowout vacation for next year, and I want to be able to do all of my research ahead of time in order to do that. So. Um, the, that that whole major digital reorganization due to COVID and a bunch of the underlying correlations like AR, VR, the rise of, of machine learning and so on have just um, overwhelmed marketers' ability to, to keep up. Yes, and it's accelerating for sure. Well, we've reached the end of our time. Thanks to everyone for attending AdAge's custom webcast sponsored by Redpoint Global. So on behalf of our guests today, Steve Zisk from Redpoint Global, thanks so much for your time. Have a great and prosperous day.